I'm going to specifically talk about best fit framework synthesis. And as I've mentioned, um, I, I do have a, an intellectual vested interest in this because we devised this um, because we felt that there was a lack of transparency about approaches to framework synthesis. And um, we felt that there was this tension that you see in other types of review like realist synthesis, where um, you could um, have a, a rigorous process, but um, it may might be difficult to report that. Um, and so we wanted something that was um, a bit more transparent. So, so best fit framework synthesis um, requires that you identify a relevant framework theory or conceptual model. So it's no different from framework synthesis there. Um, but um, one of the things that we recognized was that instead of spending a lot of um, review time trying to get that framework uh, absolutely perfect, that actually, um, as long as the framework explained um, a majority of the um, uh, the data, then it was going to, if you like, help you fast track. And as long as you had procedures to make sure that you could take care of the remaining data in a systematic way, um, that um, it was quite legitimate to, to get on more speedily with um, the extracting of the less problematic data, if you like. And, and um, so we wanted to make absolutely clear where the data fitted the existing framework and where it was actually um, where new data added or contributed uh, materially to uh, a new version of the framework. Um, and uh, so this involves um, uh, deconstituting a framework or a model, um, uh, populating it with data, um, and then looking at the data that, if you like, is, is left over. And, and of course, um, as in the world of taxonomy, you can um, create broader categories, you can split categories. Um, if you find too much data um, under a particular label, you can look and see whether more granular um, labels are required. So there's a lot of flexibility about what you can do at that second stage. Um, so this is really the distinctive characteristic. Framework a best fit framework synthesis really tries to fuse together the strengths of framework synthesis and thematic synthesis. So you have a first stage where you have an explicit framework, you extract all the data that you can from the included primary research studies, um, uh, and you analyze that data that fits against the framework. Um, and that um, uh, allows you to for example, see the extent to which your data confirms the framework as it is. And then you engineer a separation. You turn to the data that didn't fit in the framework. You use an inductive process of thematic synthesis to generate new themes for any data not covered by the framework. Um, and as a result, you produce a new conceptual framework or model or theory uh, and it's very important then that you, you test that um, theory um, to see um, the extent to which the data supporting these new elements, these new um, concepts, um, is um, well supported in the leftover data. So it could be very thin uh, data or it could be lacking in context. Uh, and so you uh, want to really, re re really, if we could put it simply, you're critiquing your own framework rather than unleashing it on the world um, un, un, um, uh, evaluated. And so this is the the stage of the process, and we've already had reference to the fact that you uh, do double searching. You find the primary research studies for your um, topic, but you also find a best fit of, of any frameworks or models uh, for that topic. Um, and um, as mentioned, um, by reducing the requirement to find the perfect framework, although still wanting to avoid the full start, by reducing that time, this is um, believed by um, uh, experts such as uh, Mary Dixon Woods that um, this can speed up the process, so be particularly useful um, for um, areas of policy um, related uh, synthesis. Um, but she, she um, quite rightly highlights some of the dangers that once you've sunk your efforts into the model, uh, you might find yourself um, uh, avoiding or um, being blind to um, uh, any evidence that um, uh, is problematic, that challenges the framework. Um, 
that that could be protected though by a uh, use of a wider range of literature and by consultation of stakeholders but of course that has uh, time implications so it's a balance between um, the validity if you like and the practicality um, but nevertheless her overall conclusion was was that um, um, that uh, this was uh, something that, that could be used in a very pragmatic sense and uh, this uh, editorial accompanied her own use of it uh, for a health foundation synthesis. Um, so just uh, to conclude with a couple of technical points here. Um, so how do you find these frameworks in the first place? Um, well, we've got this important stage we've referred to where you're trying to find um, the frameworks. Um, and as we said, they may appear in the empirical literature or they may be in a completely separate literature. Um, but um, most permutations can be retrieved by a combination of these four um, terms. Uh, theory truncated, so it gets theoretical, framework, frameworks, concept and conceptual, uh, model and models. Um, so, um, and you'll see that some of the other terms I've used throughout the um, presentation, such as logic models, or conceptual framework or program theory would all be retrieved um, by this basic string. Um, and um, uh, if you're specifically looking for program theory, as you might do to write the what, what um, how the intervention is is thought to work in a Cochrane effectiveness review um, or in a realist synthesis, um, then you can use a, a, a wider string of uh, terms specifically uh, related to program theory, um, taken from the work of Neil and, and uh, uh, Dylan Neil and James Thomas. Um, and here you can see an example of it actually being used uh, on Google Scholar uh, combined with a, a topic here. You'll notice that the topic isn't um, tightly specified. Um, you uh, judge the appropriateness of the frameworks by um, um, uh, by manually reviewing them, uh, you don't construct a very tight um, search strategy. Um, and as we said, one of the criteria is to check whether it covers the same stage of the process. Um, and uh, another interesting uh, addition is being able to search for these um, theories um, through uh, using uh, ordinary Google, not Google Scholar, but using the images facility because so many full text articles are now available. And in this case, I took um, one of my uh, PhD students topics. They, they are actually doing realist synthesis, but they have an in, equal need for theory. And um, within 30 seconds, it's not always this quick, by combining these frames, phrases of model, theory, framework, and concept with their topic of interest, men's sheds, um, I found two candidates um, for um, uh, uh, one from a qualitative study, primary study, and one from a systematic review um, that uh, have some authority. And interestingly, um, in a sort of um, uh, off-the-cuff evaluation, these uh, appeared as two critical items of literature in their, in their accompanying systematic reviews. So, in fact, it, it pointed to literature that was otherwise validated through systematic review processes. Um, another thing that you can do is use some of these compendia of theories. And um, here we have um, a, a couple of examples, one from evidence-based practice by Joe Rycroft Malone and colleagues. Um, uh, we have, um, uh, if you like, a hit list of some of the most dominant um, models in health education and health promotion, um, and also a, a compendium from Susan Mickey and colleagues uh, on behavior change theories. And so just as you choose to paint for your bedroom, you can go through these and see whether they have elements that relate to the phenomenon that you're interested in. Um, so this gives you a sort of ready swatch book um, to, to select from. Um, and of course, you can use policy frameworks. This is the WHO um, evidence to decision framework, um, which we uh, used in a recent uh, mega um, uh, aggregation. Um, you can use logic models. This is from the Cochrane uh, qualitative review uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and what you do here is you turn the various boxes and some of the subcategories within those uh, into elements on your data extraction form. Um, and you can also use um, uh, sort of more on the fly frameworks, although of course these um, uh, are reflecting um, uh, project, uh, sorry, program logic rather than um, deep conceptual thinking. 
So in terms of then how do you choose which framework to use, I did mention there were a couple of um, attempts to do this, and, and Jane says uh, some of these are referenced in our guidance. So there's the um, guidance from um, Dam Schroeder um, on the terminology and language, um, whether um, uh, the th uh, theory of interest promotes comparison of results across contexts and across time, and um, whether it stimulates theoretical developments. But in more um, detail, um, criteria um, from Davidoff um, and, and Dixon Woods there suggested criteria for a theory in behavioral change. And um, here's the third one here, um, uh, which um, uh, operates again in the area of behavioral models, but um, uh, 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 may be used generically, such as the origins of the theory, the meaning of the theory, the consistency of the concepts, et cetera. So um, to conclude, to give you uh, time for some remaining questions, um, framework synthesis does offer considerable flexibility, that word again. Um, it can be a readily accessible way for engaging with theory, particularly if one um, lacks uh, confidence in engaging with theory through theory building processes such as grounded theory or uh, meta-ethnography. Um, the identification of a framework or um, the development of a framework with stakeholders may add some extra time and project planning constraints, and there's the danger of a full start. Um, but if you identify an appropriate framework, it can um, achieve um, considerable time savings, although you have to continually be aware and make sure as a team that you resist squeezing data into framework categories. Um, and so framework synthesis um, is also a versatile tool for new methods of qualitative synthesis, such as rapid qualitative synthesis and overviews of multiple QES. So thank you for your attention. We've just got about five minutes, I think, for some remaining questions. Thanks very much, Andrew. Such a great talk and covered so much ground in such a short, short space of time. So thank you. <clears throat> and some great questions coming up, um, some of which Jane and I have kind of um, answered during it. But equally, I think there might be some worth some additional explanation. Um, so there's a couple of questions come up on a kind of a similar theme of actually testing the new model resulting from the best fit framework synthesis. Um, so I don't know if there's anything more you'd like to say about that. Jane part has answered it a little bit, but I thought it might be worth a broader explanation. Or Jane, equally, you could come in. <clears throat> well, I'll just do a quick one and then let uh, hand over to Jane. So, so just to say that you know the health <laughs> warning is that um, people very often focus on the process of finding the studies and synthesizing them, but um, as with quantitative reviews, people can often short um, track the uh, analysis and interpretation phase. And so putting in these protections, testing, I mentioned sensitivity analysis to see where the data is coming from, how rich the data is, um, some of the other considerations uh, um, on the quality of the theory, that, that that's really as much part of the method. It's not just finding um, a, a grid and, and just um, doing the synthesis. Mm -hmm. Jane, is there anything you'd like to add there? Sorry, I'm muted here. I was just wondering, Andrew, could you say a little bit more about conducting the, uh, the sensitivity analysis? I put a little bit in the chat, but um, I've, I've, you know, I think you're the, you're the expert here and people would like to hear it from you. Well, well a, a number of people have, have done sensitivity analysis. Um, uh, it, it's a little bit more challenging than doing it in quantitative <laughs> because you can't actually take uh, studies out in the same way as you can with uh, discrete individual studies in a meta-analysis. But essentially, what you do is you look at the studies that support um, particular um, uh, areas of your conceptual framework, your conceptual map, if you like, um, and use some uh, markers such as um, uh, rigor, relevance and richness to um, decide um, whether that particular concept on the map or on the framework um, is supported by strong data or not. Uh, so it needs to be formalized in the sense of being able to present that um, uh, analysis, but um, um, the, the exact um, quality markers you use um, uh, are very much up to you to, to um, specify. And I've just suggested the three R's there. Thanks, Andrew, that's really helpful. Um, somebody had asked a question which they said was, 
could be a cheeky one, <laughs> but actually that you'd put, uh, previously you'd shared a PDF of references related to the webinar series. Is it possible to share an RIS output of the same so we can import to our ref management libraries? But I did apologize, so it was cheeky, and no worries if not at all possible. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you, if you could uh, direct email me so I know who to send it to, yes, that would be, be fine. Um, <laughs> I can certainly convert those fairly easily. And uh, quite a <coughs> excuse me, quite a practical question just come in from uh, Natalia. Can you do data extraction coding and data interrogation in NVivo? That's quite an operational type question around. Uh, this. Absolutely. And um, uh, Catherine <coughs> um, Houghton um, has written an article exactly on on that, and her application was framework synthesis. Um, I, I haven't got the reference to hand, but I, I will happily um, email to you, Nat Natalia, if you email me separately. Um, but um, yes, the author is Houghton. It's uh, on the use of NVivo. And the other thing to say is that you can find some useful um, uh, hints and tips um, in material on realist synthesis where you have similar issues about coding large amounts of qualitative data. So there's a couple of articles on use of NVivo there as well that might also inform. But the main one is the Houghton article. Thank you. And there's been a couple of questions. I've kind of grouped them together just as a final one about reporting guidelines for uh, framework synthesis and best fit framework synthesis. I don't know if you have a view. Yeah, well, oh, uh, uh, James just, <laughs> James just absolutely. <laughs> I was just going to say exactly the same is that we wouldn't expect framework synthesis to have any um, uh, additional requirements in terms of the elements. The only thing that I would say is that where the searching um, section uh, in NTREC is very often focused on the uh, topic, mm -hmm. and then you need to have a similar level of reporting detail on the identification of the framework. So just because there's that, uh, or just um, in view of the fact that there's that double search okay. process that you should doubly report the two aspects of the search. But that that's the main um, difference. And I suppose the other is is around the appraisal, isn't it? Uh, if you do the sensitivity analysis and the quality markers, then which ones did you use and what did you find? Thanks, Andrew. And I think it's really helpful to, to really identify that actually there is a search around the topic, but equally there's a search around um, the framework. And it, it, there's been a number of questions around that, so I think it's really helpful to have that further emphasised. So thank you.